Good evening and welcome to the Gloucester Marine Genomics Institute's September Science Hour. I'm Chris Bolzan, GMGI's Executive Director. Tonight kicks off our fourth season of the Science Hour. A dozen speakers, over 1,200 viewers, all sharing our passion for science education. We are so excited for the fall lineup and to have you with us tonight. This evening, you are going to hear from Dr. Steve Palumbi, who is a professor of marine sciences at Stanford University and director of the Hopkins Marine Station. He's gonna be speaking to us tonight about climate change and corals, but first a few words about our organization. GMGI addresses critical challenges facing our oceans, human health and the environment through innovative scientific research and education. By bringing world-class science and transformative workforce development to Gloucester's historic waterfront, GMGI is catalyzing the regional economy. A strategy triad guides our work. Our research institute, led by Dr. Andrea Bodner, our Donald G. Combs Science Director, whom you will hear from shortly, pursues a platform of advanced molecular biology and genomic technologies that is expanding our understanding of the world's oceans and accelerating discoveries impacting fisheries and human health. In the past year alone, they have cracked the lobster genome, published groundbreaking work on the long-lived red sea urchin, journeyed from the Azores to Norway aboard Ocean X in pursuit of new discoveries, and made progress towards translating research that will stimulate our local economy. Our education initiative, which is led by Dr. John Doyle, prepares recent high school graduates to become professional laboratory technicians through our Gloucester Biotechnology Academy. Just a few weeks ago, Governor Baker and his team joined us as we cut the ribbon on our new biomanufacturing learning environment, doubling the capacity of our program and enhancing our curriculum with state-of-the-art new equipment and protocols. The Academy class of 2022, our sixth cohort, began their training just a few short weeks ago, and we are so excited to watch where they will take this opportunity. We'll keep you posted on that. Through our science community work, we actively promote conditions that encourage the establishment of a vibrant science community in and around Gloucester. 2021 has seen some terrific progress on this front. We've had our full capacity at our landmark building at 417 Main Street with new science collaborators joining us on Cape Ann. And I'll tease just a little bit of news that's gonna be released next week. Mass Econ will be formally recognizing GMGI's economic impact on the region in their annual awards program this year. So on to our main event. Tonight, I encourage you to please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen for any questions that you might have for Dr. Palumbi. Thank you all so much for tuning in and for continuing to share in our excitement for our oceans and science education. I'd also like to thank all of our amazing sponsors for this new season of the GMGI Science Hour. In particular, huge thanks to our presenting sponsors, Ms. Elizabeth Moore, the 1911 Trust, a wealth management firm on the North Shore focusing on wealth management for generations, and the James and Gail Bacon Family Trust. With that, I'll turn the screen over to Andrea so that she can introduce Dr. Palumbi. Andrea? Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us this evening. I'm Andrea Bodner, the Donald G. Cohn Science Director here at GMGI, and it is my pleasure to be introducing tonight's Science Hour speaker, uh, Dr. Stephen Palumbi. Uh, Steve is the Jane and Marshall Steele Jr. Professor of Marine Science at Stanford University and the Harold A. Miller Director of the Hopkins Marine Lab or the Hopkins Marine Station. Uh, Steve received his PhD in marine ecology from the University of Washington and started his career as a professor at the University of Hawaii before moving to a professorship at Harvard University and then ultimately joining the faculty at Stanford in 2002. Steve has had an incredibly distinguished career um, dedicated to understanding and preserving the diverse array of life in the world's oceans. His research group studies the genetics, population biology, evolution, and conservation of a wide range of marine organisms uh, that range from whales to sharks, corals, mussels, abalones, and of course, my personal favorite, the sea urchin. 
Steve was actually one of GMGI's very first scientific collaborators, uh, working with GMGI on a COD population genetic study, and we're honored to have him join, joining us again this evening. Steve has been recognized with numerous awards for his work. He is a Pew Fellow in Marine Conservation, a Fellow of the California Academy of Sciences, a member of the National Academy of Science, and was awarded the Peter Benchley Ocean Award for Excellence in Science. In addition to hundreds of published scientific papers, Steve has published several books for non-scientists, has appeared in several TV and film documentaries, and continues to work on the micro-documentary project called the Short Attention Span Science Theater. In addition to his interest in science, Steve is also a musician and is a founding member of a band called Sustainable Soul. Um, and Steve has long been fascinated by how quickly the world around us changes and is interested in human-induced evolutionary change. His talk tonight is gonna to focus on work he has done on corals in America, Samoa and Palau, where he has identified corals that are resilient to climate change. So with that, I'll turn things over to Steve. Thanks very, very, very much um, for both of those great introductions. And, and just, just let me say uh, from, from out here in Monterey in California that I, I really do admire the, the Gloucester Marine Genomics Institute for all the work that, that you all do. Um, the, the, the combination of sort of frontline research and, and a really incredible dedication to, to teaching students at all ranges and all backgrounds about kind of the wonders of, of biotechnology, how to do it, how to get a good job at it, how to be a scientist, how to just how to use that in their lives. I think that's just such an amazing thing. And, and I just salute you for that, that extra focus. Um, Having high school students and teaching them and then doing world-class research can go together. So, um, so thank you. I, I just think that's, I've always thought that was great. Um, I'd also, I'd also like to mention that um, the, the directors of the Hopkins Marine Station are now Theo McKelly and, and Jeremy uh, Goldbegin. I got promoted from director to regular faculty member, sort of the, the normal academic uh, uh, transition. They're doing a wonderful job with the Marine Station and encourage you all to, uh, to visit there. Um, and, and just with that, I just maybe launch into kind of where, where I wanted to, to, to start this, um, this evening. Um, basically, what I was hoping to do is to, to talk to everybody about, you know, what it's like to be in a place like this with the coral reefs, this is Hawaii actually, um, thriving, living, growing, supporting an enormous number of different um, critters all around. Um, and, and the sorts of things that we can do uh, in genomics and in marine biology to kind of uh, look at the problems that those places are facing. Um, and then how to use in particular uh, these genomic tools to try to move forward uh, with a sense of helping them gain higher levels of resilience. Um, and uh, unlike a lot of the kinds of genomic um, talks that you might, you might have where we know a huge amount about um, mice or, or eucalyptus trees or, or even sea urchins, we don't know that much about the genomics of corals and so we're just pushing ahead um, kind of from the basics. And what I wanted to do was to show you what that's like, um, tell you why we're doing this work, where we're doing it, and some of the, some of the people um, that are involved in that. Um, so why, why are we even doing this? And that's, you know, shown in this kind of, of uh, picture. This is actually Australia, the Australia um, brush fires from about a year and a half ago. Being in California, Central California, we have them quite regularly around here in the summer. And, and we all know that there's increasing cases of, of extreme weather events, extre extreme environments like fires, um, floods that are going on increasingly all over our country and all over the world. And so as a, as a marine biologist, as an ecologist and evolutionary biologist, I think about how do these, how do organisms, how do populations adapt to those changes and what can we pull from evolutionary biology that might actually help us, um, help them um, do that. Uh, and, and when we think about climate change in particular um, and how organisms really react to that, there's, there's sort of four ways that, that that can happen. 
um, species, individuals can move in the face of climate change. Uh, they can acclimate, adapt, or die. And um, if, if you work on things like corals that can't move that much and you would really rather them not die if, if you can help it, then you've got acclimation and adaptation as a response to climate uh, that we can begin to work with. So that's going to be my focus for what we're doing uh, with corals is balancing between those and trying to understand them. Um, of course, there's this fifth way of dealing with climate change uh, that we have. And I just like to say that, you know, I've been you know, over the last couple of years, this has gotten less and less common even in the United States that we just shove our head in the sands and pretend it doesn't exist. Um, I think we have a, a, a renewed unified mission to not only stem climate change as a problem, but also work uh, to, to help organisms, other organisms, um, humans too, through it. Why, you know, what, what does climate change actually do now? And um, there's a lot of things that are happening because of climate change now. Uh, these maps here are the maps of um, Atlantic cod along the, uh, the east coast. You're, you guys are right there in the middle of, of that coastline there. And um, in the past couple of decades, Atlantic cod populations have started shifting to the north as water temperature has increased. And models of that over the next 20, 40, 60 or more years show an increasing movement of cod populations out of your area um, to the north. And that provides an incredible amount of disruption to local communities, to the way people live, to the history of a, a long history of fishing that I know has gone on in Gloucester and, and all around Cape Cod. Um, this is just one of many, many, many examples of the kind of movement pattern that you see as a consequence of, of climate change. Uh, but this is another consequence that, uh, that I see a lot. Uh, this is a bleached reef. Uh, those white things there are corals that um, have bleached. Uh, they've turned white because the tissue is transparent and you can see the white skeleton underneath. Uh, and that means that they've been heated by ocean warming. They expelled their symbionts. Most of these corals um, are either dead or they're going to die very quickly. And, and this kind of damage uh, to ecosystems, especially in big coral reefs like the Great Barrier Reef, is so extensive that you can actually see it from space. It's been happening on a global scale since the first global bleaching in 1998. It's been happening more and more and more commonly. And so, so this disruption to this global ecosystem is probably one of the best examples of climate change affecting an important ecosystem uh, that, that many, many millions of people rely on. Um, around, around the world. But as a biologist, you also see things like this. Virtually everywhere that I have seen a, a bleaching event and, and everyone else that I've talked to, you, you'll run into this kind of situation. That coral on the right is bleached. Coral on the left is the same species in the same place and it's not bleached. And so an evolutionary biologist, ecologist will look at that and say, huh, why did that one survive and on the left and the one on the right did not? And if we can understand that, can we use that knowledge either to help corals survive uh, more bleaching events or to use the corals that are more resilient to, to heat um, to, to try to build better reefs? Um, for the future. So that's, that's the basic structure around which I've been working in this field for about 10 years. This simple observation, there's variation in the world, in the coral world, what's causing it and can we use it for something practical? Well, um, why would we think that this kind of variation is important and why would we think that evolution in the face of climate change might actually happen? And, and so I, I just went back to kind of one of my first book called The Evolution Explosion and, and tried to pull out examples of evolution that we know has happened. This is from a 1949 paper about can you select mice to be bigger or smaller over the generations? And what you can see is that artificial selection um, managed to make some very big mice in this case and some pretty small ones in, in, in the lower graphs there. So we know from lots of cases that artificial selection can work in domesticated settings to, to evolve species to be different. 
Uh, and then it can happen in, uh, in the wild as well over pretty rapid time frames. This is a picture of the mean weight of, of pink salmon in Alaska um, as a function of time since really intensive gillnet fishing was going on in Alaska. And again, um, you can see there's a steady uh, decline in, in body size. And that's because the gillnets catch the biggest salmon. The only salmon that were actually allowed to, to spawn in the streams were the ones small enough to slip through the, the net. So there was a selection pressure for small salmon that, that led to the population getting smaller. Um, and, and then on another case, here's bighorn sheep in a, in a hunting park in Canada. Um, the hunters there would rather take a bigger trophy home than a smaller trophy. They're selecting against males with bigger horns. And over a couple of decades, that, uh, that selective pressure caused the evolution of 30% smaller horns in this, in this population. So, so we have plenty of examples of evolution happening quickly over a space of a couple generations. And so does that help us understand maybe how um, corals might evolve or other species uh, might evolve in the face of, of climate change? So that's sort of the general question that we've been trying to get at with a lot of this. Can corals evolve to be more heat tolerant? Um, and in order for that to happen, um, we, we need to know that there's variation in heat tolerance. We need to know it's genetically based. And um, there has to be enough selection uh, to allow the heat tolerant corals to survive better, but not so much that everybody dies. And so that's kind of the structure that we're, uh, we're going to talk about. Uh, we've called this a Strong Corals Initiative. It's very similar uh, to a wonderful collaborator that I work with, um, Ann Cohen's program at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Um, and uh, what we're trying to do is understand how these corals can survive more heat uh, because they're going to be faced with that um, in, in the future. Um, I just want to take a second to actually show you where it is we work on this. This is PICRIC, the Palau International Coral Reef Center. And um, this group here in Palau, run by Native Palauan scientists, is a fabulous place to work. And I just deeply appreciate the, the, uh, the ability to work in Palau in this, um, in this community uh, on Palauan reefs that really have been part of this culture um, in, for uh, 2,000 years. Um, and the people at Pickrick and Coror State and Emelik State and Garlong State and Kyangle States uh, have all been incredibly generous in allowing us access to these um, communities. So I just want to be stop and thank those communities uh, for allowing us to come into their neighborhoods um, and study their, their reefs. Um, and this is kind of why we go, because it's so gorgeous, and it is so incredibly nice to, to be able to work there. This is our boat coming through the Rock Islands towards uh, the Palau International Coral Reef Center. Um, and so on the bottom are some of the folks who work there. Victor Nestor, who's a Palau and researcher, who's uh, one of our main um, collaborators there. Uh, Brendan Cornwell, the postdoc, Nia Walker, and, and Elora uh, lopez Nandem, who are grad students. And then um, other, uh, the conservation uh, managers and the conservation directors of Kyangle State, for example, uh, on the right. So we come into Palau at Pickrick here. What we've done is to try to um, use this structure to ask a pretty simple question. Um, are there heat resistant corals that are out there in, in the environment? That's our, that's our first question. Uh, we do that by bringing in corals from surrounding reefs around the islands of Palau, um, placing them in these, uh, these heating cooling tanks. These are programmed to heat up and cool down as if the corals were exposed to a very low tide and a very sunny um, summer day in the back reef on patch reefs. And by exposing them this way, we have essentially a standardized test for how they react to that kind of heat. So we've basically developed this in order to have essentially a stress test, a stress assay that we can compare uh, from one coral to another. And, and this is the kind of result that we get. These are five corals. Um, 
that have been exposed to two different kinds of temperatures. Our control tank is at 30 degrees. Our heat, our heated tank in this case, um, heats up to 34 degrees for the afternoon for about three hours and then comes back down. The next morning we, we score the coral branches. Um, each of these coral, each of these corals has two branches there. The top one and the bottom are the same coral, the same clone, um, at the two different temperatures. And so, and so you can see the one on the left is pretty heat tolerant. It doesn't, it doesn't do anything in this one day of heat treatment. Whereas um, the coral there, red, surrounded by red, is very heat sensitive. The same kinds of heat that affected the um, didn't affect the first coral as a strong effect on the second one and bleaches it enormously. Um, so this is the way we basically tell what a heat resistant and heat sensitive coral is by doing this very standard kind, this very standard kind of assay. Um, and so the, the, the great thing about Palau is that we can uh, take boats around to these various patch reefs, um, collect corals, and over the last couple of years we've collected, tagged, mapped, photographed 400 corals on 39 reefs around Palau. And each of the red dots here uh, represents a, a, a heat resistant coral. And we take two kinds of messages from this map. Uh, one is that they're pretty much everywhere. Every, almost every reef that we went to, we found at least one heat resistant coral um, on it. Um, and so that's good. They're not restricted to just a few places. Uh, but they are more common in some places than others. In particular, uh, you might notice in the middle there on the left, there's a whole lot of red dots all together in Amalique states in those reefs. And that represents a set of um, corals that are more heat resistant than other places around. So we know we can find them. We know there are lots of places. We know that there are some reefs, which happen to be the warmest ones, where they are more common. So that's our kind of first result. Uh, and that result then leads us to try to figure out what's causing that variation in, in, the, in coral heat resistance. And so we sort of back up a little bit and go into, into basic biology and sort of basic science. What are, the, what are the major ways that organisms can differ from one another? In, in the case of corals, they can acclimate. Um, the warmest reefs might cause the physiology of these corals to, to alter so that they can deal with stress better. Um, they also have symbionts. The symbionts are what is expelled during bleaching. We know some symbionts are actually easier to hold on to during the warm water than others. And so it's possible that the, the corals um, that are more heat resistant just have better or different symbionts in them uh, than the other corals. Or they could have the right genes. Uh, the corals could have the right genes uh, to allow them to be more heat resistant um, in, in the face of, of the tests that we've done and also the kind of heat that comes with a, a global bleaching event. So um, there's also a couple of other things that might, might go on. There's competitors, there's microbes, there's other, other types of things, but these are the three major, major ways, the major hypotheses for what generates heat resistant corals. But they're different from one another. And the way they're different from one another is that the first two are actually temporary. Activation works both ways. If you have a coral in a warm spot and it's heat resistant and you move it to a cool spot, it loses its heat resistance. We've done that in transplant studies and other people have as well. The symbiosis is also temporary. If you move a coral from one, or a coral has a very um, heat tolerant symbiont and the heat goes away, oftentimes they will switch back to the, the heat sensitive symbiont because they grow better with that. Um, the one thing here that is not temporary is the, having the right genes. And in that case, we've got the right genes and uh, you're heat resistant and you're moved to a different spot, you'll still be heat resistant. So using the heat resistance uh, depends upon that the mechanism of that heat resistance being more permanent or durable rather than temporary. And so part of the goal here is after having found that we have a trait, we have a trait that's variable heat resistance, then to dig into what is basically controlling that trait and being able to use that. 
So we've gone about that in two very different ways, one of which is sort of low tech, but broadly um, applicable. And those are called common garden experiments. And the other is the genomic approach that I'll tell you a little bit about um, that tries to get at the underlying genetic mechanisms of, of all this. Uh, the, the, the common garden approach was really is, um, done magnificently by a, a grad student of mine um, who finished up a couple of years ago named Megan Mark. Uh, this is uh, one of her 10 common garden nursery plots. This is in American Samoa. Uh, and what's shown here are four different coral species. They're growing, obviously, all together in a common garden where they're seeing a common environment. Um, and yet those corals come from very different locations. The corals that are surrounded by the, the um, the blue lines are from parents that lived in relatively cool parts of the reef. And then the corals that are surrounded here by the red lines are from parents that lived in a very warm part of the Samoan reef. So they came from coral whose parents um, were uh, heat resistant, red spots, and or heat sensitive. Those are the, the blue spots. Uh, so Megan set up these experiments in 2014. In 2015, one of the strongest Central Pacific bleaching events came washing by. And this is what we saw afterwards. Uh, some of those corals are bleached. You can tell that they're white. Um, some species didn't bleach at all. Um, others bleached quite a bit. In general, you see more white bleached corals in those areas that are surrounded by blue than by red. And if you quantify the bleaching of these corals as a function of, of where their, um, their parents or their, their original clones came from, um, you get something like this, that the um, clones that came from sensitive, heat sensitive parents uh, in the orange uh, bleached th two to three times more than the corals that came from heat tolerant parents on the reef. So what this showed was that the um, heat tolerance you could see on the reefs in American Samoa was actually transferable in a common garden setting, meaning that it wasn't temporary, it was durable. Uh, at least part of it was. Other experiments that we've done, we did in Samoa about the same time, suggested about half of the difference we see between heat tolerant and heat sensitive corals is due to acclimation, and about half due to these more durable fixed differences, probably the genes um, in the corals themselves, um, although there could be what are called epigenetic effects um, that affect them as well. Symbionts are not playing a role in this particular system in, in American Samoa. So uh, we know there's differences. We can find them with these, with these stress tests, both in Samoa and in Palau, and then uh, we can use them uh, to, in a common gardens and have those traits um, be uh, remain there. So um, what do we do at this point? Well, as an evolutionary biologist or an ecologist, um, you often find you face trade-offs. Actually, as just a normal human being, <laughs> you, you find trade-offs all the time. And I use this picture as one of the, one of the key kinds of trade-offs that evolutionary biology and ecology has, has documented. This is the, the Irish elk. Um, it was common in Great Britain uh, before people arrived there. Uh, this is a male Irish elk. They had the biggest horns of any um, un any elk um, species that anybody knows about, uh, and it they were so heavy that they were basically pretty cumbersome. Uh, they worked pretty well in Irish elk when there weren't people around hunting them, but once people arrived, um, those horns uh, basically were 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 a terrible. Uh, a terrible thing. It meant that they were very easily hunted uh, and were hunted to extinction. So in this case, the, the tr there's a serious trade-off between the horn, which allows males to compete better for mates, and then the, the fitness of, of those males that, that have those horns. And so trade-offs are pretty common in evolutionary biology. We basically asked the question for, for corals, um, is there a trade-off? between heat resistance and other traits, because if there is, we need to know about it and incorporate that into our planning for use um, in, in these particular systems. 
Um, we also uh, started asking that question because of the really uh, great work of Ross Cunning uh, when he was doing his PhD with Andrew Baker at uh, the University of Miami. And what Ross uh, and Andrew found um, was that there was a trade-off uh, that in their experiments, corals that had the most heat resistance tended to grow more slowly. And they grew more slowly because of the link um, that I'm going to show you about right now, because we found the same link in our studies in corals in, in Palau. And that's uh, another feature of the coral symbiosis, which is the density of the symbionts that are in the corals. It's not fixed. It's not exactly always the same. Um, these are two colonies um, in our study. Uh, they're both the same species. And um, one of them, the one on the left, colony one, 190, has a pretty high symbiont load. That is, it's dark brown. Symbionts tend to be our sort of golden brown color. Um, and the number of symbionts uh, per square millimeter in this coral um, are, is about three times as high as for coral 126. Uh, it's living just a, basically a couple, a couple miles away um, and a similar depth. A similar environment. It's uh, basically though has a lo much lower symbiont load than um, coral 190. Well, all, among the 400 corals that we tested, uh, there's quite a variation in the symbiont load. How much? How many symbionts these these corals had? And when we started comparing the uh, bleaching resistance and the heat resistance of these corals, um, we noticed that in fact. Um, the corals that had the highest symbiont load um, actually uh, had the, um, the most bleaching. So the score here on the y-axis is called retention. That's how much of the, of the chlorophyll is left in the coral after we expose them uh, to these strong bleaching conditions. And on the left of this figure are corals that pre have, have pretty high retention, that is, they're, they're pretty bleaching resistant. These are most of the, the high bleaching uh, resistant or high heat resistant corals in our study. But on the right side of this figure, those corals are losing a lot of their chlorophyll during their bleaching um, test. They are bleaching quite a bit. And they start out with a lot more symbiont load. Um, than the other corals. So as you get more and more symbionts, then during bleaching, they're expelled more and more and more. And this is exactly what Ross um, and Andrew found in their study. Um, but we were also able to take this to the next level uh, because symbiont load is actually potentially beneficial. The more symbionts, the more potential uh, food is transferred to the coral by those symbionts. And so when we actually looked at our corals over the, over the course of a, of a year, uh, we basically mapped and tagged them in 2000, or late 2017, um, went back to them in 2018, did the same thing. Um, and so we could look at growth. When we do that, we, we notice that corals with higher symbiont loads are actually growing faster. In both cases, there's a lot of scatter in these data, um, but, the re but the results are um, significantly, uh, it's significant in both cases, um, the negative relationship between um, symbiont retention and symbiont load and the positive relationship between growth and symbiont load. Um, and so that represents a, a trade-off between these two features. Higher symbiont loads in corals might mean they can grow faster, um, but bleach more, um, lower symbiont loads is related to higher heat resistance, but also lower, lower growth. Um, so that lets us know an important feature of the corals themselves and something that is a little bit of a cautionary tale. If we were to choose just corals that had high heat resistance, for example, we would be choosing sort of pale corals with low symbiont load and, and slow growth rates just within this one species. Um, is that the kind of set that we want to use, say, for our um, 
our protection of corals and using them uh, for restoration purposes. Uh, and the answer is maybe we don't necessarily want just the few colonies that uh, have the highest heat resistance if they're also going to represent relatively slow growing slow growing forms. Because that's where we are with this particular um, set of data. We know that they're variable. We know that there's other features of the coral that are important. Um, if we're then going to use this information in any kind of conservation um, or management context, then uh, we have to know if there are these particular trade-offs. This represents uh, uh, some of the folks who are working with in in the atoll of Pine, north of Palau. Um, that's one of my undergrad students photobombing a picture. And um, these conservation rangers are essentially uh, setting up some, um, some test nurseries uh, to see which corals grow better in their particular atoll and which ones, which corals uh, we can find that are more heat resistant to help those, help those things grow. Well, um, so far we've been using physiology, we've been using common garden experiments to, to do this kind of work. Um, we've also launched into the genomics of this, and I'm just going to show you this one, one or two couple of, of figures about, about this work because it's just now ongoing. Um, because of the rapid increase in the ability to sequence genomes uh, and the rapid decrease in their cost, we now have um, 300 corals, all the basically 300 of the 400 corals in this study um, have their full genome sequenced at low pass, about 1x coverage for these, but it lets us then find single nucleotide polymorphisms that are called SNPs um, in these genomes and then individual by individual relate the, the genotypes that we see in these individual single nucleotide polymorphisms with the traits that those individual colonies have for their growth rate, their symbiont load and, and their uh, retention, that is their um, ability to retain chlorophyll during, during heat stress. Now, when you do that, uh, well, we're based, our data set is on the order of about 10 million different positions in the genome that are variable. Um, and we've got about four, 300 colonies that we've mapped that way and that we have the retention load and growth data for. So there's a lot of combinations of, of, these, of these data. And that's, that's one of the amazing things about genomics. I'm, I'm sure you all have basically had to confront the fact that <clears throat> once you get the data, analyzing the data for something like this is a huge task. Um, and uh, figuring out which genes and which genomes are correlated with a trait is actually something you have to step through pretty carefully. So we're just at the beginning of that. And uh, we know a couple things right off the bat. There is no magic gene. There is no single gene in these corals that just turns on heat resistance or turns on um, genetic load. Um, if it was, we would have found it <laughs> and we don't find it. So what we do find is a, is a set of patterns that look like these traits are actually um, caused by many genes. And those many, these multi-genomic signatures um, then are a pretty common way that other organisms, even you know, domesticated or agricultural organisms, have, have, different, have different traits. So what I've done here is I have um, just graphed the number, the proportion of these single nucleotide polymorphisms that have a particular level of correlation between the SNP or the single nucleotide genotype and the phenotype. And there's lots on the left side of this figure. There's a lot of single nucleotide polymorphisms that have low correlation. They're basically just randomly, just randomly associated with um, the trait. But as you go along the x-axis to the right, you get higher and higher levels of correlation. And of course, the number drops. Um, well, what's interesting in this case to, to us is that the number drops more slowly for growth than for anything else. There's higher levels of higher correlations for between the genetic variation and growth uh, than for the other, the other two features. 
And uh, with this sort of analysis, you can go in and estimate how many genes you'd expect just by chance to show this pattern, um, and then begin to dig into whether or not uh, there's significant genetic related relationships between any one set of genes and these features. So I'm, I'm just sort of, I'm actually belaboring this a little bit. This is, this is how you sort of churn through the initial data sets. Um, if you don't have one of these amazing genes that turns on a trait, um, you've got to essentially sift through a lot of genes to find the set that are playing playing a role. Um, so uh, we find, for example, um, with the with the correlation of the growth that we expect just by chance 500 genes to have a, a sort of high R square of, of 0.35 and there's 667 of them. So that's more than we would expect. Um, it means that a lot of these genes with high correlations aren't really playing a strong role, but some of them are. So it gives us a, basically something to work with. Uh, we know that of those that are playing a strong role, they tend to be clumped together more than we would see and that they're, they're actually within genes rather than between genes. So, so all of these are suggestions that there are in fact selective signatures in the genome that relate uh, to growth. Um, it's basically walking through the data um, showing that they, there are non-random um, correlations between the genetics and the traits in ways that give us confidence that we're actually measuring something um, and uh, that we should keep going with this, with this basic um, approach. Uh, the genes that pop up uh, from this analysis that are uh, where there are single nucleotide polymorphisms that are related to growth, there's more than one of them uh, in a gene region and they occur within a gene rather than between genes. Um, they fall into kind of metabolic genes like these metabolic transporters, lipid metabolism. There's some that have come from our other studies that are really strongly bleaching related, like the tumor necrosis factor receptors um, in cyto cytoskeleton genes. And then genes like ion channels that, that may play a role in, in calcification. So these sorts of, of results are actually hypotheses. We take these data, we say the, the data set suggests these relationships between um, polymorphisms in these genes and growth. Uh, that's what comes out of this data set. Um, and the way you deal with that is by not concluding that, oh, these genes are in fact the genes that control growth. Um, in fact, these are hypotheses that you then test in the next set of data, which is what we're doing right now. Um, and repeating a lot of this in, um, in different conditions um, and experimentally in, in Palau. Um, we're also then taking these data and looking at the way genomes evolve in corals because we don't really have much of an idea of that. Uh, luckily, uh, colleagues um, in, at uh, New York University um, had recently published the first chromosome level um, map and sequence and build of a coral genome. That's for a, a species that's called <coughs> Acropora millipora. Our species is called Acropora hyacinthus, the tabletop coral. So it's in the same genus. Uh, so we, we um, put together a chromosomal level genome for that and um, compared it to Millipora. We found the same number of chromosomes, 14. We found the same genes on the same chromosomes most of the time. Um, but in fact, what we were also able to show is that even though these different corals had um, very, very, very similar genome architectures, there were about 78 translocations uh, between these two genomes. Um, those, two, those 78 translocations within a, a genus of organism are really really a lot of translocations um, for this kind of comparison. We're just in the middle of trying to understand the nature of those translocations and, and whether or not adaptive genes within those translocations actually are playing a strong role in the divergence of these, of these corals. And that harkens back to some of the work that Andrea uh, mentioned that, that I was um, honored to do with um, Gloucester about the cod genome. Cod the cod genome has an architecture that's very peculiar. It has super genes 
in it, regions of chromosomes that um, have particularly adaptive genes uh, within them. And so we're basically looking within the coral genomes whether or not they have the same kind of super genes that might help us um, look at the differences within and between, between species. Um, I'm just going to like give you the topics of other things that we're trying to do in the lab as a consequence of this. Um, one of the grad students we uh, have, uh, Neil Walker, has been looking not at bleaching, but at bleaching recovery, because uh, the whole package of resilience is not only how you resist a stress, but how you recover, recover from it. So um, Nia has been doing that, um, showing here, putting in some racks in order to do a common garden experiment, essentially bleaching corals and then putting them back out on the reef in order to see how they recover and look at the different re recovery dynamics. Uh, she's just now got a download of transcriptomes from seven, 280 different colonies in her common garden experiment, and so she's got her work cut out for her uh, to sift through those data and figure out what's, what's going on with that. And then, and then finally, this is the Kyangle community again, in a, in a workshop we did with a, the whole community teaching them how to transplant corals. Uh, and our, our goal here is to, uh, is to not is not to go into the genomics of what makes a, a strong coral a strong coral, but just to be practical and say, well, what do we know about corals that are permanently heat resistant? And can we use that um, to, to grow uh, nurseries and then restored reefs that are not only heat resistant now, but also will resist, in heat, in the, resist heat in the future uh, when the water gets warmer and warmer and warmer um, because, because of climate change. Um, so um, do that. So sort of finally, and then I'd love to have some, some time to, 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 to um, hear some talk about questions. Um, you know, what do we do with this in the sort of broader uh, arena of climate change? Um, one of the things I think that, that we have come to be pretty clear about is that our, our future in the next century depends upon getting a grip on CO2 emissions. Um, and they they just need to they just need to drop to zero by about 2050. And I can't do that. I can't make that happen. Um, the financial and political and social and religious sides of our society are much more likely to be able to do that. And I will do everything I can to help them. But does that mean I don't have any other job except to sort of cheer them on? Um, and the answer is no. I do have a job, and my job is to save as much as possible for the century that we're facing because it will get better at the end of that century. And what I want, at least for corals and coral reefs, uh, and the same might be true for forests and grasslands and, and, and a huge number of other ecosystems, at the end of that century, I want there to be enough for those ecosystems to grow back from. We're sort of stuck with a, with a climate related problem but it's not going to be here forever. So that in mission um, to help things grow back in the future by saving as much as we can right now. And, and what's motivating our work on corals is that I think we can do that. I think we can play a big role in that. And that's going to be in communities like Kangle with, with, with people like, you know, we're showing here because those people are going to be managing the restored reefs of the future um, while climate change plays out. And I'd just like to say, again, thanks very much for the opportunity to talk uh, with you all. And I'd be real thrilled to, to have questions if we got time. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Steve, for that wonderful talk. Um, there are lots of questions, so we may not have time to get through them all. Um, but uh, we'll start off with a question from James Bacon, who's asking, what is the big picture on extent of bleach damage globally? What are the potential treatments and chance of recovery if ocean warming continues? Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, sort of tried to get to that a little bit at the, at the end. Uh, the picture is relatively bleak. There's more and more bleaching as time goes on. Um, but we're also seeing cases where reefs that bleached 10 or 20 years ago are bleaching less now. And that might be because of this evolutionary change that I have been talking about. Um, and our goal is to try to use our knowledge about which corals right now are more heat resistant to try to help that evolutionary dynamic along. 
Um, I'm the, I don't know whether that's going to work. I have a feeling it's not going to work perfectly. Um, but I do also really firmly believe that if we don't try it, then um, we won't have coral reefs that will grow back really quickly. Thanks. And a question from Jan Walker. Could you uh, talk a little bit more about the symbionts, um, what they are and their place in the overall ecosystem? Great question. Symbi these symbionts are so strange. They're, they're a kind of single-celled alga called dinoflagellates, and I swear they're alien life forms from some other universe. They have weird chromosomes that are, that are always condensed. They have chloroplasts that are all reticulate all throughout. Um, they, they, they just act very differently as sort of genomic animals or genomic entities. Um, but they live within the coral cells in this little vesicle called a symbiosome. And they have a great symbiosis with the corals in which uh, the coral feeds them nitrogen and phosphorus and nutrients, and they feed the coral glucose. And it's that symbiosis that makes coral reefs so productive because the water in tropical areas is not very productive. That's why it's so wonderfully clear. Um, but that symbiosis makes it really productive. All right, re related to that from Graham Walker, he says, you describe the corals are expelling their symbionts. How do you know that the symbiont symbionts are not actively leaving because the host has become inhospitable? Yeah, you know, a uh, great question. That is one of the central kind of perplexing puzzles of all this. Um, we kind of think they're not leaving because they don't have any mo no motility, um, the symbionts, but they could be causing the corals to spit them out uh, because once they're spit out they're out and they could con conceivably um, you know go into a different coral uh, and live there uh, so we don't know whether the, the 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 symbionts are producing toxins which make the coral cells spit them out or the corals are spitting them out because the symbiont is damaged by the heat and is no longer providing them any glucose we do know the whole reaction takes place very quickly. So um, there is some active mechanism that, that does it. And honestly, no one knows what the trigger is. Is it potentially related to oxidative stress? It is. And so that's one of the hypotheses that the, the breakdown in photosynthetic ability in the, in the symbionts creates reactive oxygen species or reactive oxygen molecules. And those reactive oxygen molecules sting the symbiont and sting the coral and cause it to, to spit those out. The data for that are equivocal, fr frankly. Um, it works. It doesn't work in different experiments. It seems right, <laughs> but there's many other things that could be going on in the relationship uh, between the corals and the symbionts. That so it's it's not quite it's not quite clear. It's interesting. I was thinking about that from respect to when you say the high symbiont load gives you um, more bleaching, and maybe it's because of higher produ production of oxidative stress. Well, that was exactly what Ross's hypothesis was when he discovered this like eight, seven, eight years ago. And it, again, it makes perfect sense. And if it, that, that'd be great because all we would have to do is put in something that would stop the, our, the reactive oxygen molecules from accumulating and like problem solved. But those experiments haven't worked so elegantly. <laughs> <laughs> it's never easy. <laughs> no. A question um, from Zach Schwartz. Are symbionts passed from parent to progeny? And could genetic variation within some symbionts themselves explain any of the heritability of heat tolerance? Yeah, great question too. And the answer is yes and no. The answer is yes for some kinds of coral. Uh, they, per they, they pass the symbiont on in their eggs and larvae. Um, uh, the corals that we work with produce eggs. Uh, they spawn them one or two nights a year. They don't have symbionts in them until the larvae settle down in their final spot and then pick up local symbionts. And I didn't show you, but we have from the genomes of these corals, we can also look at the genomes of the symbionts and we can look at the population structure of the symbionts. And it's different from reef to reef go a mile or two to another reef and the symbionts are slightly different populations uh, than, than the other ones. 
All right, there's a question from uh, Tom Pease who asks, how are your research results applicable to cold water reefs and deep water reefs? Yeah, not so much. Um, another, good, another good question. A lot of the cold water reefs and, uh, and almost all of the deep water reefs have corals that um, don't have symbionts. They're called, you know, non-symbiotic non um, corals. And they, they live and grow and um, make skeletons just by feeding. Um, tropical corals also feed and, and eat zooplankton and other things. Uh, but the corals that are deep water are strictly feeding and they, they don't have these symbionts. So they don't suffer from the symbiosis breakdown, but they do suffer from heat effects because they're cold water animals and heating them up just causes um, the, the kind of normal stress that cold water animals get when they're too warm. Excellent. Uh, a question from Shelley Trigg. Interesting, the symbiont load is related to growth and bleaching, but what about the symbiont, symbiont diversity? Yeah, um, we see, we don't see that much symbiont diversity within a coral. So because the genomes, the, the genomic data are so you know, easy to get. We have lots of reads of these genomes, and so we can map those reads back to the symbiont genome. And sometimes we we see strong evidence that there's two two kinds of symbionts within that coral because they're mapping to different kinds of the symbiont genome that we put into the mapping program. And in those cases, we know that there's a, a variety of the symbionts in those corals. Other people have seen that. Um, with, with other kinds of tools. But in our case, it's pretty rare. We only see that in about 1% of those colonies and um, only, in a couple of, only in a couple of places um, do we see that. Okay, a couple of questions from Chip Searing. Uh, he wants to know how large is the coral genome? Uh, it's about 400 megabases. Okay, so relatively. Tolerable, yeah. <laughs> And uh, will selective advantage, you sort of touched on this, but will selective advantage be sufficient to promote populations of heat resistant corals to proliferate over those that are less so? It depends on the trade-offs, entirely on the trade-offs because it, it should allow um, the proliferation of heat resistant corals. Um, but if there's some, some barrier to that, if there's some deficit that those corals have as a function of being heat resistance, then that selective pressure will only go so far. And, and that's the importance of trying to understand the, 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 the physiology and the, 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 geno the genetics or genomics of, of those trade-offs um, and why we're sort of looking at both growth and or growth and retention and load and its genetic correlates. Because here's the hope. I was looking at those graphs and they have all that scatter which is a scientist who say, oh, 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 scatter. I don't like scatter. Um, but maybe the scatter's real and maybe some corals have broken through that trade-off. Maybe there's some corals that have high growth and high load and high retention. And, and, and we would really want to find those. Uh, so if that scatter's just experimental error, nah. It does, that isn't going to be the case, but maybe it's real, and maybe we can find those corals that break the correlation, and and do do better than all the rest. All right, um, we're just uh, out of time here, I'm afraid. Although there are uh, several more questions, but thank you everyone for turning in your questions, and sorry that we didn't have time to get to them. Um, and I'll turn things over to Chris to wrap up. And uh, just one last thank you to you, Steve, for uh, a wonderful evening. Thank you, uh, Andrea. And if, if you want to if you want to send those questions to me, um, you know, I'll be I'll, I'll I'll give a try answering them. Uh, I really appreciate the audience sticking with and, and being interested in this and the and the ability to to talk to you all this evening. Thanks. Thank you so much, Steve. That was fascinating. And thank you, Andrea, for spending the evening with us as well. I know uh, I'm getting a lot of text messages. People are really enjoying this and loving this. I know uh, the coral reefs are of great interest to our community and your application of genomics is very relevant. So thank you so much. Um,
Thank you again to Elizabeth Moore, to the 1911 Trust, James and Gail Bacon for their sponsorship, and to everybody who tuned in tonight and continues to support GMGI's mission. If you were inspired by what you've heard tonight, please spread the word, um, share the news about the GMGI Science Hour and the amazing lineup we have planned for the fall with your contacts, with your community. Um, we would really appreciate getting the word out there. We love sharing science education with our audience. Please also consider sp supporting GMGI, our mission and our work. We're so grateful for your continued engagement. Stay tuned, stay in touch. We have a fantastic schedule lined up um, for the fall. If you stay on a moment, I'm gonna share a slide with the dates and the speakers coming up and um, save the dates. Good night, everyone. I will see you in October. Thanks again, Steve. Thank you so much. Cool. Those are good. Those would be great talks. Okay. Ciao. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.